<clears throat> well, thank you, ladies. Enjoyed that very much. We did get an update on my dad during the break. He's doing much better, so we are thankful for that. Continue praying. We want to get him out of there as soon as possible. <laughs> so that's our main objective, I think, right now, getting him, getting him to the point where he can go home. That's uh, what we're looking forward to. All right, well, let's see if we can't pick up where we left off from our last hour study. Of course, we are in our series called Changing Times. <clears throat> well, let me put the, the announcements back up there. There they are. We saw them first hour, so if you have any questions about the announcements, I'll, you can ask me afterward. All right, let's move on. <coughs> However, before we do, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer. Let's ha take advantage of that time to exercise the privacy of our priesthood to make sure that we're in fellowship uh, through the principle of rebound or confession of our sins silently and privately to God. And uh, then we'll be ready to study, and God the Holy Spirit can lead us into the truth of God's Word this morning. All right, with this in mind, let us pray. Well, again, Father, as we approach your word, we do so with, our, with the expectation of learning more about our Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we open your word, we know that it's an opportunity for us to learn more about our Savior. We thank you for the opportunity to assemble together in freedom this morning, again reminding us to continue to pray for Client Nation America and for our leadership that we might see a move back to the principles of your word so that our nation can stabilize and continue to function effectively as a client nation to you. This morning, as we approach your word, we look forward to establishing again in our soul the, the anchor of your word, that which helps us face adversities and difficulties in our life. We know that you have, since eternity past, made these things available to us. So may God the Holy Spirit lead us into them and make them real to us, but we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, if you will, 1 Peter chapter 5 is where we're looking at. We are dealing, of course, with the believer's field manual on suffering. And we're studying paragraph number 7. <coughs> and we're seeing in 1 Peter chapter 5, <coughs> excuse me, four results. results that God has for bringing adversity and difficulty into our life. Remember, with every crisis, there comes a purpose. God had you in, etern in eternity past. God had you in mind with reference to his plan and his purpose and his will, which he, of course, has determined, centering it around our Lord Jesus Christ. And now that you and I are members of the royal family of God, we have been identified with Christ, We've been placed in union with him. We have received everything that God the Father provided for the humanity of Christ. He's never, he never did this for any other group of believers, and uh, all those, of course, in the Old Testament, nor those uh, in the future, tribulation believers, or even millennial believers, will not have the privilege that you have as being an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And while you're living in, on this earth, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you have the indwelling of the Father. You have the indwelling of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, live what we know of as the Christian life or the Christ life. Now, God's intent during the church age, since the church is left here, a body of Christ, each one of us is a member of the body of Christ. We are royal family of God, ambassadors for Christ, a royal priest while we're here. In order for us to be able to live effectively, victoriously, and represent our Lord Jesus Christ while he's at the right hand of God the Father. God the Father has provided for us everything that we would need. And of course, as we live in time, God will allow suffering and adversity and difficulty to come into our life. He allows people to come into our life. 
uh, people that we do not like, people that we would not choose ourselves to associate with. But yet sometimes we find ourselves in relationships, situations, and circumstances where this is the case. So how are you going to handle it? Are you going to react? Are you going to use that as an excuse not to really learn the spiritual life and grow spiritually? Are you going to be able to, uh, in your reaction, are you going to be able to justify yourself? Are you going to deceive yourself? Uh, are you going to become absorbed in your own self? And then, of course, are you going to be able to uh, justify your uh, self-indulgence in whatever direction it takes you? Listen, God allows suffering to come into your life to test your spiritual life, to test your faith, because the proving and the testing of your faith, as I mentioned last hour, is more important than any aspect of the details of life, any relationship, any situation, any circumstance, any material thing that you will ever have and encounter in this life. The testing of your faith is more valuable than that because it is the testing of your faith and the testing of my faith that allows us to utilize what God has provided, the, gra the provisions of his grace, these are the things that glorify Christ in the midst of adversities and difficulties, and especially in undeserved suffering. And so therefore we saw in this passage that there are four things. Let's go back and we'll read it. <clears throat> and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, that's the purpose he has for you, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. All right, so we're looking at these four results. We've seen the fact that God wants to perfect you in your spiritual life. Uh, he wants to cause you to become stable in your spiritual life, strong in your spiritual life, effective in your spiritual life. He wants to equip you with what you need. And this word perfect means to bring into your life that which would make your life complete, that which, of course, would effectively make your life effective for Jesus Christ. All right, so we looked at the passages. And then to confirm you, to hold fast, this is the superglue we talked about in one of our previous classes, because what holds you together in the spiritual life is, first of all, your faith in Christ, that's the gospel, and then your knowledge of the Word of God, your growth, your spiritual advance in the spiritual life. And this is how God wants to confirm you make you fast and stable in your spiritual life. And then he wants to strengthen you, and this, of course, is where we were studying. The fact that God wants you to be strong in your spiritual life. We even talked about uh, the process of spiritual strength, how you gain strength, how you advance in the strength that God has provided for you. And, of course, we did that by looking at Isaiah chapter 4, verses 29 through 31 learning to trust him in the situations. You may not be able to see through the circumstance. You may not be able to understand the circumstance. You may not like the circumstance. But when you make sure that you're in fellowship and you're applying the principles of God's word in this relationship, circumstance that you find yourself, you can be assured that if you're doing that, Jesus Christ is being honored. Whether anyone else understands it or knows it or not, it's not important. God knows when we're redeeming the time. He also knows when we're squandering the time. God knows when we are operating on the truth. God knows when we're hedging, when, you're, when we are using things in order not to continue our spiritual momentum and spiritual growth. As we talked about, we can kid each other, we can fool each other, but we can't fool God. He knows whether or not we are redeeming the time for our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so that's more or less where we were winding up. The result of spiritual strength is the ability to stand firm against the devil and his conspiracies, against his schemes. And this is what Paul tells us, that we are to be like uh, men, standing strong, be strong, and let everything that you do be done in the sphere of our Lord Jesus Christ and, of course, the fruit of the Spirit especially. Uh, that's what he says. Well, let me... Jot down 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, before we leave this one. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14 says, Be on the alert. Be on the alert. 
he says. Stay focused on what your mission is and what your commission has been. Stand firm in the doctrine. Stand firm in the faith, it says in the English here, but it means stand firm in the doctrine. That is what you believe, the doctrines and principles of the Word of God. Act like men, he says. And that, of course, uh, you know, that transcends any gender concept here. Men means uh, believers standing firm in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be like men, he says. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in the sphere of love. Now the love here represents the concept of the, of the filling of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the one who produces His fruit in us. As you and I walk in the Spirit, then it's possible for the love and the joy and the peace and the, and the other aspects, the other uh, rest of the nine characteristics of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ can be produced in you. First of all, on the basis of what you think, you win the battle here first. The battle is either won or lost between your ears. And so therefore, not outside what you're doing, but on the inside. And so therefore, be done in, in love emphasizes in the sphere of love, which means in the sphere of the filling of the Holy Spirit, being in control of your life. Because the filling of the Spirit equals the fruit of the Spirit. They, you cannot separate them. They are linked together. And then when we say that we saw <clears throat> so early in Ephesians 6, 11, to put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, the schemes, the strategies, the conspiracies of the devil. Now, Peter said, you might want to write this one down. Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, just previous to our verse that we are studying, be sober of spirit. What does that mean? Basically, same thing Paul meant when he said, uh, be alert. Stay focused on the spiritual life. Don't get distracted. Don't allow the details of life to come in and distract you. The details of life are wonderful things. They're legitimate things. They're the things that God has given to us to enjoy as believers living here. But these things are not to distract us from the spiritual life. We are not to put these things ahead of our spiritual life. We keep our priorities squared away. God then will bring capacity for the details of life, capacity for happiness, capacity for uh, stability in your life, blessing in your life, happiness in your life. God will give you capacity as you grow spiritually, and he'll pour these things into the cup of your soul. As David said, my cup overflows. Be sober, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, strong in the doctrine, firm in the doctrine, firm in the Word of God, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So right maybe under this verse, you should say, No room for woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. My goodness, nobody's had to face what I'm having to face. No one's had to deal with a person like this. No one's had to live with a person like this. No one's had to, no. Peter says, forget it. You're letting it become an excuse. I'm, I'm sorry, you're trying to use it as an excuse, but it becomes a reason. You're out of fellowship. You're not applying the principles of, of God's word. That's why it's going like it is. Because you have a firm foundation. God has brought you to the point where you can be perfected and completed and strengthened in your spiritual life. But you're ignoring it. You're putting other things ahead of it. And so therefore, he says, no woe is me. <laughs> no woe is me. That's out. That's important. In the time in which we live, these changing times, it's very, very important because Spiritual strength. If you gain this spiritual strength that we've been talking about now, last hour and now into this hour, it will enable you as a believer in Jesus Christ to help and to bear the frailties and the weaknesses of others. As a matter of fact, this is what Paul said in Romans 15, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. He said, we who are strong, that is, we who have been taking in the word of God, we who are in that category that the writer of the Hebrews told us last hour, 
then by this time, hey, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be communicators. You ought to be leading the charge. You ought to be the ones out front. You ought to be the pace setters for God. You ought to be the, the risk takers that God wants to raise up during this time, this uh, challenging time of Client Nation America. You should be the ones leading the charge. You should be teaching others. However, so many of you have come to need milk again. <laughs> because you need somebody to teach you ABCs all over again. Because you have become negligent. And what you have not been using, you've lost. Now you've got to go back and relearn it. And go back over it again and review it. And nail it again in your soul. So we who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses and the failings of the weak. And not just simply to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his neighbor's good and benefit. In order to strengthen him and build him up. How are you going to do that? If you are succumbing to the circumstances and the situations. If you're going to be griping and complaining and moaning and groaning. About the political scene or the economic scene or whatever scene you're in. How are you going to encourage and build up somebody else? How are you going to encourage them in the faith? How are you going to tell them when you're down in the mouth? No. Have you forgotten that God in eternity past was aware of all of this before it ever happened? And he knew that you would be here. As a matter of fact, David explains to us that God planned out every, that God was aware of every day that David would live and had made everything uh, available to David that David would need to live the spiritual life of the Old Testament. God had already done that long before David was even born. So David understood the omniscience of God and the omnipotence of God. God's ability to know and God's ability to solve the problem. That's why he can make the, the demands and the commands given to us uh, in the New Testament for you and for me as we'll continue to see some of them. But he hasn't left anything undone. Uh, he was aware of that situation. He was aware of that circumstance. He was aware of that relationship. He was aware of this. But however, he let it come into your life. Why? Because he wanted to test your faith. Why? Because he wants you to learn that that's the most Im invaluable thing that you're going to have in this life in order for you to pass that test and to glorify Jesus Christ. Because that's why you've been left here. So facing undeserved suffering Facing things we don't like, facing things we have no control over, is the opportunity that God gives us to glorify Christ. And that's why we're here, to glorify Him. And so therefore, He wants to strengthen you for all of that. All right. Let's move on to the fourth one. He wants to establish you, Peter wrote. The Greek word here is themi li uo, T H E M E L I O O. Themi li uo is the Greek word here. Again, this word means to establish. It really means to set firm on an unwavering foundation. To establish or set firm on an unwavering foundation. For us, what does it mean? To establish a way of life. I'm glad he left this one for the last one. Because you see, God has a spiritual life that he wants you to live. That spiritual life is patterned after the life of Christ. He sent, he sent his son, not only to provide salvation, which he did, because we believe that our Lord Jesus Christ came, and you know, we're getting ready to, to, to celebrate and recognize Christmas. So he came into the world to live here, incarnate among men, made in the form of the servant, he humbled himself. He lived his life in humility. And he went to that cross and he died for our sins. He was buried. And on the third day he arose from the dead. All outlined in scripture, the word of God says. And so our Lord Jesus Christ came to establish that way of life. Between his birth and his death, he lived 33 and a half years. We have the privilege of having recorded for us that last three and a half years. Now, he lived his life on the basis of what God had provided him all of his life, not just those last three and a half years. We know that from, from Luke chapter 
uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, that tells us that this was the lifestyle of Christ. This is the way he lived his life. This is what he always did when he was filled with the Spirit and when he was led by the Spirit, when he used the Word of God and when he, uh, when he returned and functioned in the power of the Spirit. That passage tells us that this was his way of life. <laughs> this is the way he lived. So now, guess who we're supposed to follow? Guess whose life, our life, is to be a tracing of? Guess in whose steps you and I are to follow? The humanity of Christ. And so therefore, Paul says here, uh, Peter says here, God wants to establish you on an unwavering foundation. That is the foundation of the life of Jesus Christ, and he never wavered. Now you and I, of course, will waver. But the foundation will not waver. Make sure you understand the difference. Make sure you understand the difference. You may waver. You and I, when we know we'll waver and we know we'll fail. But there again, the grace of God comes in, does it not? And makes provision for us. But the foundation will never waver. The life of Jesus Christ will never waver, regardless of what comes <clears throat> down the pike and people try to tell you to defame the life of, and the ministry of Jesus Christ. All kinds of nonsense, the false doctrine comes out with. All the human viewpoint and human opinions and ideas, worthless as far as God's concerned. The foundation of, our, of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and the foundation of the Word of God will never waver. So that's why we need to sink our roots deep, deep into the life of Christ and deep into the Word of God, which is one and the same thing for us. All right, so this is the word, Thamiliuo, to establish, to set firm on an unwavering foundation, to set up for us, the royal family of God, to establish a way of life or a lifestyle. Well, this is what, this is what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7. He said, God did not give to us a spirit. Numa here refers to a lifestyle, the way you conduct your life, that which motivates you in the function of your life. That's the spirit of your life. What motivates you, what drives you to do whatever you do, those two things combined becomes the spirit of your life. And so here's what he says. God did not give us a spirit of timidity, fear, fear. Remember the principle. Fear is bondage. Faith is freedom. That's what the Word of God teaches us. Fear is going to plunge us into slavery to something, someone. And then, of course, faith will set us free. The truth will come, and the truth, and fa our faith and acceptance of the truth will set us free. All right? He did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit, a lifestyle, same concept here, not the Holy Spirit. This is the lifestyle of, this is your life that is to be not uh, a fear, but rather one that uh, speaks of power, God's power. But a lifestyle of power, a lifestyle of love, and a lifestyle of, of self-control or self-discipline, consistency with the uh, utilization of the Word of God. A life built on the filling of the Holy Spirit is the word for love. So there's power, there's love, and there's self-discipline or self-control. This is the lifestyle. As a matter of fact, Paul had amplified that whole principle for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Actually, this passage in 2 Timothy is an amplification of what Paul gave in 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And you and I have studied this verse nine ways to Sunday. We have developed all kinds of things out of the concept of the spiritual lifestyle given by Paul in this passage. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, it, pro it provides us with the three primary ingredients for your approach to life. The three primary ingredients that becomes reality in this establishing you uh, here in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5. Of course, the approach to life, developing a, cor a correct spiritual lifestyle is faith, hope, and love. These three remain, Paul says. Faith, hope, and love. 
Love is the greatest of these because it's a consum- it pulls all of them together. It's a collection because you operate first. You learn, first of all, to walk, all right, to crawl, actually. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, keep on walking in him by faith. So you start by faith. You continue by faith. You develop from there uh, your confidence in God. And then you develop, of course, your love for God. So love encompasses uh, the faith and the hope. We've studied that, I've said, in a lot of different ways. So that's what Paul is talking about, about the spirit of power, love, and, and of self-discipline. A lifestyle of faith, hope, and love. The faith approach to life, the confidence approach to life, and the love approach to life. It takes you from your infancy through your childhood to your maturity. That's the faith, hope, and love. And we've done it that way also in the past and study. And also in James chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, James chapter 1 and verse 6. In this passage, James describes the believer that does not become settled, does not become established, has not developed these approaches to life, has not even developed the faith approach to life hasn't gone anywhere since he's become a believer. He's just being stymied. And of course, he becomes the victim of the circumstances in which he lives. He's talking about prayer. In verse 6, and we we cut in at this point, he says when he's talking about praying, but let him ask in the sphere of faith, trust, dependence. When you go to God and pray, you must pray on the basis of faith. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what the writer of the Hebrew says. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, James says, but let him ask in faith without doubting, without wavering. For the one who doubts, he says, is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Listen, if you don't learn to walk on the basis of faith, you're going to be tossed around by every wind of doctrine that comes along. Every circumstance, every situation, every malady that comes into your life is going to control you. You're going to become a slave to people. You're going to become a slave to circumstances. When you allow people to control your life, you know. When you're occupied with people and what they do and what they're not doing, what they do to you, what they don't, don't do to you, that you're their slave. You're serving them. You're under their control. The very thing that you lack, the very thing that you hate worst of all, this may be an individual and you don't like this individual, and so therefore this individual may have a position in your job over you or whatever it might be. And so therefore this person, you can't, you can't stand this person. This person is obnoxious. You know. And so whenever that person comes around, which you wish they would never come around, they come around and you react with bitterness, resentment, rejection, hatred. You just put yourself in chains to that person think about it you're under their control just the opposite of what you really wanted but that's what happens when we react in these situations all right don't become that individual who is not developing that faith approach to life learning to trust god in the difficult circumstances just because you can't see through the cloud just because you can't see through the fog that doesn't mean that there's not a silver lining across the clouds on the other side. Because there is. It's God's plan and God's purpose and God's will for your life. That's what he has for you. The very best. God hasn't withheld any good thing from you. Everything God has given to you is the very, very best for the purpose of living this spiritual life, developing this spiritual lifestyle. So, don't waver. Ask in faith, he says. You go to God, just because you don't get the answer that you think you need or that you want, 
Does that mean that God didn't hear your prayer? If you were in fellowship and you prayed, God heard your prayer. But it may be no. As a matter of fact, Paul learned it was no, and it was no, and it was no again. As a matter of fact, so much so that God said, listen, we ain't going to talk about this no more. <laughs> this is over. It's done. So, when you go and ask God, does that, does that mean that God didn't have an answer? Oh, gosh. He had a fantastic answer. He didn't have the answer that Paul wanted. Paul wanted that thing out of there. I don't Get this out of my life. You may be saying, get this person out of my life. Get this malady off of me. Get this away from me. I don't want this anymore. I don't want this situation, the circumstance. And God says, oh, you don't, huh? Listen, there's a solution for it. That's what you need to seek, the divine solution. It's an opportunity for you to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Don't be tossed by the winds that blow. Don't be so frail in your spiritual life that you're tossed to and fro like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the winds. If the believer is not on solid foundation, produced through, of course, learning and applying God's word, he will be tossed here and there by the waves of false doctrine, and he will be a victim of the trickery of men. See, Satan uses men to trick you. He uses people to trick you. Do you know that? He sure does. Oh yeah, he uses people to trick you. He tricks you because he wants you to react on the basis of your emotion. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to get out of fellowship. He wants you to have something built up into your soul, in your soul like bitterness or resentment or implacability, uh, hatred, malice toward individuals, or toward it could be toward a circumstance or a situation. That's what Satan is going to play to. And so he's going to trick you. He's going to use individuals and situ situations and circumstances. Is God going to allow it? Sure, God's going to allow it. Yeah. Why? Because God wants to do for you exactly what he did for Job. He wants to give you an opportunity to stand firm for the principles of the Word of God. That's what he wants you to do. Why? Because then you have resisted the devil when you do that. And guess what? Pew! All you see is his backside. He's gone. He can't deal with the Word of God. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So he can't deal with it. And so you resist him firm in the doctrine. You resist him and he'll flee from you. He doesn't have the power that you have. All right, so don't be tossed by the waves of false doctrine and the trickery of men. This is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, remember? When he wrote this, he said, As a result, we are no longer to be children. As the fact that you and I belong to Jesus Christ, the fact that God has made provision for us and given us everything that we need. And by the way, that's what the book of Ephesians is all about. It's about your position in Christ. And so much of the provision that has been given to you as a result of your position in Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine or teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in the sphere of love. It's the truth that sets you free. It's the truth in your life. It gives you the freedom when you put your faith in it. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him, that is Christ, who is the head, even Christ. And so the believer who does not learn to deal with the adversities of life, what are you going to do? You're going to fragment your life. You're going to fragment your life and you're going to create, manufacture more crises in your life. That's what you're going to do. He reacts and intensifies his problems, causing more misery, more frustration, more difficulty, more pressure for himself and for those in his periphery. It, that stuff's contagious, you know that? Negative volition is contagious. Anger and hatred and resentment. These things are 
a contagious disease, mental attitude sins. Contagious. And we get caught up in it, and we become infected when we fail to utilize God's problem-solving devices. We learn the fact that, listen, God has provided problem-solving devices for us to face every contingency of life itself. And we're not going to use them 100% of the time. We're going to become victims. We're going to become slaves. We're going to become all of these things because of the weakness of our own flesh. I understand that. And so does God. That's why he's given us the recovery system that he has given us through the concept of confession of sin. If we would acknowledge our sin, if we will side with God and be honest with ourselves and be honest with God, if we will say the same thing that he says, if we will confess, acknowledge our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so therefore, this is the how you can become established in your spiritual life. Learn and pursue the concept of the, spirit, of the spiritual lifestyle of faith, hope, and love. That lifestyle not of fear, not of timidity, but one of power, love, and self-discipline or self-control. Okay, now, guess what? We're ready to take a look at paragraph 8. Paragraph 8. <coughs> Suffering can accomplish three things in the believer's life. Suffering can accomplish three things in your life. Number one, it can insulate from the arrogant skills. It can help insulate you. It can be that which God wants to build into your life that will be against those arrogant skills. Those arrogant skills, they will destroy your life, by the way. Neutralize your spiritual life and can destroy your life in general. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've read this passage before, but let's look at it again. <clears throat> Here in 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 7. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul had received the revelation of the mystery doctrines of the church. Paul was beginning to be able to put together a picture of the whole counsel of God. As a matter of fact, he told the, the uh, believers in Ephesus <clears throat> that he had not withheld from them, teaching them the whole counsel of God. Paul, as a Jew, as a Pharisee, uh, steeped in the Old Testament, when he began to learn the mystery doctrines of the church after he became a believer, he was able to mesh them together. He could see how that they coordinate the coordination between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, as far as the coming of the Messiah, coming of the Savior, uh, the crushing seed of the woman and the promised seed uh, of Abraham and the ruling seed of David. And of course the reigning seed uh, coming in the, uh, the ruling seed coming in the kingdom. So Paul was able to mesh this and put it together and see the mystery, the church in between that was never before told or given in the Old Testament between the coming of the Messiah and, of course, the kingdom of the Messiah. So he was able to put all that together. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, and for this very reason, to keep me from becoming so arrogant, huper iro, from becoming so arrogant, operating on the arrogant skills, to keep me from exalting myself. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, that is to cause me discomfort, but to be a reminder to me of my weakness. To keep me, why? He says it twice within the framework of this, you know, of this one verse. He mentions his arrogance twice. So of his arrogance, evidently Paul had no delusions. He knew he had a tendency toward becoming arrogant, full of himself. 
So again, to keep me from exalting myself. So concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, after he said, no, 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 no. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Because power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather than boast about my own weakness. That the power of Christ may dwell in me. So therefore, I am well content with these weaknesses. Even facing the insults and the distresses and the persecutions and the difficulties for Christ's sake. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. I have to be careful because wrong solutions to the believer's suffering will worsen the situation. And the abuse of prayer, by the way, is a wrong solution. And we're not going to digress and study the concept of the believer's call to prayer and all of that. It would be a good place to do it, but we're not going to digress uh, in our study from our from where we are now. Other than the fact to say that prayer is the channel through which uh, God's problem-solving devices are deployed in your life. In your contact with God, draw near to God, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. How do you do that? By being in fellowship and utilizing the principles of God's Word. That's how you as a believer, priest, draw near to God. That's how God is able to glorify his son through you and through me. And so therefore, use God's problem-solving devices. Prayer, by the way, is not a means of gaining leverage with God. Neither is it a means by which God can be manipulated. People always, you know, people like to, often we try to manipulate God through our prayer. God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Just let me win the lottery and I'll, I'll just live on 10% and give you the 90%. If, of course, it's enough. If the winnings, if the jackpot, you know, if the jackpot is big enough, then I'll just take the 10% and you can have the 90%. I would like for it to be a few million, though, if you don't mind. But I'll get all the rest of it to you. Or if you'll let me get out of this, you know, like the guy on the airplane. was ready to die because of such a terrible flight. So, uh, well, I'm not going to go into that anyway. You know the, you know the story. He, he uh, promised God if he'd get him down here, he'd give him everything he had. But then the guy said, I heard you say that, brother. He said, well, I made a better deal. I told God if I ever got on another one, he'd have it all. So I'm afraid that's what we do. Prayer is not designed, by the way, to manipulate God. The focus in prayer is always the will of God. And when you pray, remember, the issue is not what you want or what you think you need. The issue is always what the will of God is. I'm sure Paul was convinced the first time. Must be about time to
No. All right. Neither one of us had the magic touch. Okay, where were we? Verse 10 we were reading. Therefore I am well content with weaknesses and with insults, with distresses and persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, that's when I am strong. Paul learned this through his prayer life. I'm sure the first time Paul prayed, God, please take this thing away from me. He thought for sure God needed to take that thing away from him. He was sure that he knew what God uh, should do in his life. And maybe even the second time. And maybe even the third time. But finally it dawned on him. God was saying no. I'm not going to relieve this situation. You're going to have to learn how to be delivered in the face of this situation. Sometimes we can actually worsen a situation by the misuse of prayer. Making our situation, making our comfort, making our desire the issue rather than making the will of God the issue. And willing to believe that if I am filled with the Spirit and I go to the throne of grace and I put my petitions before the Lord as I am commanded to do, that he's heard my prayer. And I am willing to leave it with him and to trust him. That doesn't mean you don't pray about it again. As long as you understand that it is the will of God that is the issue here. Not your comfort, not what you want, not your agenda, but always the will of God. And making sure that when you pray, you pray according to prayer protocol. Being filled with the Spirit at all times. Because you must, if you want to pray, if you want to come before God, you must come in the power of the Spirit. Prayer protocol is made on the basis of, number one, being filled with the Spirit. Because it must come to God the Father in the power of the Spirit. It must come in the name of God of Jesus Christ and it must be on the on the basis of the of the Father's will. And so therefore we pray always to God the Father, we always pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and we always pray in the power of the Spirit. That's prayer protocol for the church. Now that was different in the Old Testament, but it's prayer protocol in the church age believer. So therefore the principle is that the focus in prayer is to be on the will of God when we are walking in fellowship, obedient to his word. When this is true, then we are motivated in our own spiritual life to do his will, regardless of what it may call for us to do. It may be wait. Uh, It may be no. It may be yes. It may be later. It may be wait a while. But you see, it has to be, the issue has to be the will of God. Therefore, when we pray in His will, we do not have to try and manipulate God, make promises to Him. Our desire will be for His will to be done in our life because that's how Jesus Christ is honored and glorified in us. It's when God's will is accomplished in our life. So therefore, our prayer should not be used to try to persuade God to give us things which may not line up with his will and his purpose and his plan for our lives. All right, so Paul said, listen, why did God give me this thing? Why wouldn't, he res- why wouldn't he remove it from me when I prayed? Because you see, it wasn't God's will. And John tells us that if we pray according to the will of God, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Think about that. That's very important. But you have to learn to pray according to God's will. And the only way you'll ever learn the God's will is from the Word of God. This is where the will of God is actually uh, delineated and laid out for us in God's Word. All right, well, I think uh, it's a good place to stop. We've got a good fresh battery to start with for our next class. (coughs) So so we'll stop here. We'll pick up again at paragraph number 8 on Wednesday night at 7.30. All right, Father, thank you again for the opportunity that we have to study these things. What a challenge these passages are to us. How easy it is for us to become distracted, 
How easy it is for us to get our eyes on the things that we think we need, especially in the area of our prayer life. But thank you, Father, that you have given to us in your word the formula for glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us the privilege and the opportunities to do that very thing. So it is our prayer that God the Holy Spirit will take these things and make them a source of encouragement, challenge, and blessing as he sanctifies them to the nourishment of our souls. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.